we are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. We will now turn to our first round table. Uh, and so let me quickly introduce our chair, Elisa Gerge. Uh, Elisa uh, is an assistant professor in the International Relations Department at Bilken University. She earned a doctorate in international relations from the University of Oxford, as well as an MA in international uh, in security studies from Georgetown University on a Fulbright scholarship. Her research focuses on nuclear proliferation and the evolution of the nu nuclear market, uh, questions of grand strategy, nuclear alliances, nuclear dominoes, and illicit trade and trafficking networks are really at the center of our, our researchers. And so thank you very much, Elisa, for being with us. Uh, for this first panel, we have Alexander Lenovska, who will be with us here at the Citadel. He will be joining me soon. And now I turn the floor to you, Elisa. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? And can you see me all right without any problem? Yes, fantastic. Thank you for the invitation. It is a, it's an honor and a pleasure to chair and moderate this panel. Um, I believe uh, we are still, um, we are sort of trying to figure out how to have uh, Professor Osinga join us as a panelist um, on, on Zoom and also Hannah Schellis. Um, I'll very briefly introduce the, uh, the topic of this round table and then briefly uh, talk a little bit about our distinguished speakers. So this round table focuses on the key military lessons learned from the analysis of Russian, Ukrainian, and NATO's military performances across a wide range of domains, including military operations, training, logistics, intelligence, and nuclear deterrence. The experts who have kindly accepted our invitation today will provide a fine grain analysis of the main areas of strength and weakness of both Russian and Ukrainian armed forces on the battlefield, as well as of NATO's support in the war effort. Um, we are grateful to have with us today, Dr. Hanna Shellest, who is the Security Studies Program Director at the Ukrainian Prison Foreign Policy Council and Editor-in-Chief of Ukraine Analytica, as well as head of the board of the NGO Promotion of Intercultural Cooperation. Uh, prior to this, she had served for more than 10 years as a senior researcher at the National Institute for Strategic Studies under the President of Ukraine in the Odessa branch. And in 2014, Dr. Shellis served as a visiting research fellow at the NATO Defense College in Rome. Previously, she had experience in PR and lobbying for both government and businesses, as well as teaching at Odessa National University. She has more than 50 academic and more than 100 articles in media published worldwide, and she's a regular presenter at the international conferences and commenter for the media. Dr. Shellist is a Rotary Peace Fellow in 2010, Black Sea Young Reformer in 2011, John Smith Fellow in 2012, Marshall Memorial Fellow in 2016, a Tubitak Visiting Research Fellow in 2018, and a Think Grad Fellow in 2019, a very impressive list of accomplishments. She was recognized as a, a 40 under 40 Ukrainian emerging leader in 2013 by the US Ukraine Foundation. Our um, next speaker, or one of our panelists, will be um, Alexander Lanoshka, who is an assistant professor of international relations at the University of Waterloo in Canada. His research focuses on military alliances and European security. He has published articles in prestigious journals like International Security, International Affairs, Security Studies, and the Journal of Strategic Studies. He's also the author of Atomic Assurance, The Alliance Politics of Nuclear Proliferation, published with Cornell in 2018, and Military Alliances in the 21st century published with Polity in 2012, 2022. He received his PhD from Princeton University and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Dartmouth College. Prior to joining the Department of Political Science at Waterloo, he was at City University of London, and he has served as a consultant for Global Affairs Canada, the U.S. Department of Defense, and other organizations involved in defense policy, policies. Um, Last but not least, we have Franz Osinga, 
Professor of Asinga holds the special chair in War Studies, which is sponsored by the Royal Society for War Studies at the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University since January 1st, 2019. Professor Asinga was appointed chair in War Studies in 2010, as well as head of the Military Operational Art and Science section at the Faculty of Military Sciences of the Netherlands Defense Academy. He is a member of the faculty board of the Faculty of Military Sciences of the Netherlands Defense Academy. And as chair, he is responsible for the BA program in war studies and the master program in military strategic studies and directing the multidisciplinary research program of the war studies department. His previous assignments include a tour at NATO Allied Command Transformation in Norfolk, Virginia from 2005 to 2007 as the liaison officer for the Ger for Germany-based newly established Joint Air Power Competence Center. Prior to that, he was the Minister of Defense Research Fellow at the Klingendale Institute of International Relations, the premier think tank in the Netherlands on international security, where he also completed his PhD. He was director of the Air Power and Strategy Department of the Netherlands Defense College from 1999 to 2000 and lecturer in air doctrine at the same institute from 1997 to 1998. He has held a number of staff positions at the Netherlands Air Force Air Staff. We are truly grateful and honored to have all three of you with us. Um, and so I will start with the first, um, uh, like an, an overarching question addressed to all three speakers. I will start uh, with this overarching question for our first round, uh, which talks about, uh, or one we're, we're seeking to, to find out what are the main military lessons learned from the ongoing war in Ukraine and the areas of military operations, training, logistics, intelligence, and nuclear deterrence. And uh, Professor Osinka, uh, I will first let you um, have your intervention on, on your preferred angle to this question. Right, Elisa, thank you. Um, I really appreciated uh, Michael's uh, perspective and analysis. Um, and I agree with it. Um, I am a general, so I'm very much replaceable. But until then, uh, <laughs> let, let me give a little presentation here on, on my take on this war. Um, there's a rediscovery, there's a lot of continuity in this war uh, as a bit of a novelty. The continuities are that we are rediscovering um, basically total war. It's a rediscovery, reacquaintance with the demands of industrial warfare where quantity matters as well as endurance. Military production capacity comes into play again. It is also a very bloody war. It already ranks among the 10% most bloodiest war of the past century. Uh, from the Russian perspective, it is also a civilization war, so it seems that ideology is back uh, also. Um, we also have to realize that any analysis must acknowledge that we don't know, actually, we don't know much about this war, especially on the Ukrainian side. There's a lot of uncertainty of what's actually the, their, their status. And any analysis, as Michael also pointed out, must acknowledge that what we see on the battlefield right now, attrition warfare, is a result of uh, faulty planning flawed assumptions, no preparation of units, failings in command and control, logistics and leadership. We don't see an application of joint warfare doctrine or combined arms operations anymore. The thing is, however, uh, when we look at lessons learned, I also want to look at it at the strategic level. Um, and we have to realize that if Russia would have contemplated launching an operation like this against NATO, it probably would have looked different. Uh, and that's where the strategic analysis comes in, in, in a bit. There are novelties, but I don't want to focus on too much of novelties. Certainly, there are commercial ICT that plays a large role. There are drones combined with artillery. It's a soldier's uh, poor man's uh, air power. We see loitering drone, drones like switchblades. Open source intelligence is, is a major issue, a major factor in, in this war. But a lot of these in, in no, novelties play out at a technical and a technical level. Um, at a strategic level, there's a lot of continuity and a lot of us, a lot of people focus now on artillery, on tanks, perhaps the tanks are perhaps obsolete now. I don't share that perspective. You really have to put it into context as Michael pointed out already. I see the similar or the familiar action reaction dynamic when it comes to drones, for instance, already 90% of drones actually are, have been taken out of the fight. The average lifespan is just four to five to six, perhaps, sorties for each uh, drone. So 
again, there's a familiar action reaction dynamic. For me, the largest continuity here is what's happening when two symmetrical actors actually meet out, meet each other uh, at the battlefield. One of our surprises has been, as Michael pointed out, that Russia has failed to achieve air superiority. And I think that Russian failure in the air war has had a lasting and huge strategic impact on the further evolution of this war. We have seen significant air operations, in particular in the first phase, with at least 1,000 missiles being fired at fixed air defense sites, command and control facilities, and air bases. But by that time, most of these airspaces air spaces had been vacated and most of the mobile SAMs had been dispersed already. After day three, that operation basically stopped because the air operation started to focus on the faltering ground operations on the Russian side. By then, week one, they had already lost 88 aircraft and helicopters. Those are attrition numbers we haven't seen since the Korean War. Since then, uh, the Russian Air Force has mostly reverted to operating from Belarus and Russian airspace. It has launched about 300 sorties a day, which is really minimal, considering the size of Ukraine. Um, considering also the fact that uh, when the West conducted peace operations, it launched 500 sorties a day, for instance, over, over uh, Croatia. Uh, from March, April, Russia increasingly started to target cities and infrastructure. And that too had an air warfare aspect. An, an air inherent objective of that uh, operation, also the operation that started in October against the uh, electricity and the power plants in October. Behind that there was the intent to basically deplete the Ukrainian SAM systems and the ammunition for them to serve the air missiles. They, these operations had a limited impact because by then uh, Ukraine had been provided with lots of uh, Western systems. Um, the frequency and intensity of attacks gradually slowed down a bit and Ukraine was assisted by the West in repairing the power plants quite rapidly. So it only had limited impact on the, at a strategic level. So all in all, uh, I would conclude that the, air war, the failing of the air war has had a huge impact on the evolution of war. Now, both sides have uh, effectively applied air denial tactics. Also, the Ukrainian uh, armed forces have not achieved air superiority over the front, and both of the armies on the ground are suffering from it. Um, but that was to be expected, because here I have two fourth-generation air forces uh, uh, opposing each other. And ever after 2014, also in Europe, we had become very concerned about our fourth-generation fighter community. Because we realized that um, in the A2 AD environment that we saw evolving, in particular in the Kaliningrad area, our fighters would be unable actually uh, to put up much of an, uh, an offensive, and we would actually not be able to guarantee air superiority over much of the Baltics and, and Poland. So there's a reason why Zelensky has called for air defense capabilities right from 25th of February. In fact, he asked for an, an um, an air denial operation to be conducted by the West, which obviously didn't happen. Now, why is the West, and this, this I'm now coming to, back to the strategic lessons learned. Um, why do I harp on this? First of all, air, the air war has been an understudied and underappreciated aspect of this war. There has been a very intense air war ongoing ever since. And Currently, there are the three or four A's that are, are in high demand. That is armor, artillery, but in particular, air defense on the surface. There's good reason for that. And we should, in the NATO side, be very worried about that, very concerned, because what we see playing out there right now, an air denial contest, is something we need to be prepared for, also in the eastern part of, uh, of Europe. From 2014, we became aware that because of the lack of air superiority, NATO could not guarantee Article 5 uh, for the Baltic and the Polish, uh, uh, Polish borders. It really undermined the credibility of our conventional deterrence posture. Our lack of SEAT and DEED capabilities, our lack of fifth generation air aircraft, really hampered us in boosting our conventional deterrence credibility. Now, this matters because NATO now has decided upon a new deterrence strategy. Instead of a deterrence by punishment, strategy, it is now also a request of Poland and the Baltic states, moving towards a deterrence by denial strategy. 
It does require, however, NATO to guarantee air superiority. Uh, and that means, as most uh, of the open source analysis already predicted prior to the war, that NATO needs to invest in counter A2 AD capabilities. That is, suppression of enemy air defense, destruction of enemy air defense, ground based and theater miss ballistic missile defense capabilities, uh, counter drone capabilities, and a larger number of fifth generation combat aircraft. Also, in terms of air infrastructure, investments need to be made. We need to rebuild redundancy in the air command and control infrastructure, in the basing infrastructure also within NATO. The key here is we need to ensure we have the dominance in air offensive. We need to restore Western asymmetric edge that we used to have until 2014, if we want to avoid getting drawn into an additional warfare that is really a game that really Ru Ru Russia likes to play, and we don't. So let me leave it at that, Eliza, for now. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, would you like to go next? I can go next, but I also see that Hana is now online. Okay, wonderful. Then um, uh, let's let's hear from Hana. Um, Hana, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure and honor to have you here. Um, the question that we were dealing with right now is the overarching question. I will briefly repeat it. Uh, what are the main military lessons learned from the ongoing war in Ukraine in the areas of military operations, training, logistics, intelligence, and nuclear deterrence? Please um, go ahead. We have about five minutes per answer for this overarching question. Thank you very much. Sorry for being delayed, uh, but I heard uh, everything what was uh, uh, told, but just in the guest mode. Uh, uh, you know, there are so many lessons that definitely we can go from the strategic to the operational level and uh, more and more lessons would come in the end of this war. But uh, uh, definitely there are several groups that I would like probably to emphasize. Lesson number one is that uh, even that we saw that we are moving from the 20th century war to the 21st century war, where the cyber capabilities or the high tech capabilities would be on the uh, uh, forefront of the uh, any type of the arms development or army development. But the uh, uh, current year demonstrated that we're in the something of the mix of 19th century uh, war and 21st century war. When you have at the same time the value of tanks the value of the army of the people on the ground and how they operate, logistics, that is extremely important, and the uh, modern technologies and the use of the commercial technologies for the military purposes. Because the role of the drones, we usually speak about the big combat drones like Bayraktars, but we are forgetting that currently at the battlefield we have Mavics, this simple drones that so many people bought just for their fun, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of them at the battlefield, and they are really becoming the eyes of for all types of the forces that are closer to the uh, um, a fighting line. So that is uh, lesson number one, that while we are developing to the 21st, we should not also forget about the uh, uh, classical stuff that is not less important, especially understanding who is your enemy. The second lesson that at least Ukrainian armed forces definitely learned, um, that is... Uh, uh, importance of the absolutely different level of the command control system. And here we are speaking about two important elements. First of all, it is the uh, middle level officers leadership. So uh, they would be able to take responsibility, not to wait command from the center for each of the tasks they need to make and uh, be able to operate in terms of, uh, uh, in case they're in the vacuum, yep, no connection or any other conditions. That's what the Soviet army never had. That's what the Russian army still um, doesn't have. And that's what helped a lot of the Ukrainian units on the ground. The second lesson in command and control, uh, that is the necessity of the proper uh, communication and coordination between different types of the forces. Not just classical, what we used to think about, like land and air, uh, artillery and infantry. No, but uh, what we have on the ground when we have National Guard, police, security services, armed forces, and all the services needed to at the uh, very hot moments to coordinate without the top coordination of the ministry's level. So on the ground coordination of all these uh, forces. And uh, uh, number three, it is the uh, use of new technologies for the command and control. That is the uh, Delta system that's been just introduced by the Ukrainian armed forces. 
That is uh, a quite a unique experience that we are now testing together with the partners and uh, uh, we still need to learn lessons from it, how effective, but we heard very positive results. Uh, the next lesson, uh, like the third group, uh, is definitely about logistics. Even that we know that logistics is always important, supply is always important, that's something like the axiom. But at the same time, we see uh, what exactly, what are the uh, modern type of the warfare bringing us. Especially we're starting to think not only about logistics within one country, but logistics between the countries. So uh, longer distance supply, and that's what we are talking about, the necessity, of, for example, of military Schengen or any other types yep, of these. So that is what is important for us and uh, what we see how it's going on. And the last but not the least, mm -hmm. it is the uh, everything what is connected of the, um, with the connection between people or society and their armed forces. Because for decades, we used to think about the armed forces and security services as something independent and society as something independent. And it's not about civil military uh, um, dialogue or something like this. No, we are speaking about the role of business, the role of individuals in the supply to the armed forces, in national resilience and protection of uh, critical infrastructure, and just in terms of the very basics on the ground support. Because when you have uh, where to hide, how to hide, how to eat, what to eat, uh, additional uh, money, not only to buy a, a medical kit, but to buy a satellite for your armed forces. That's what can change the situation uh, significantly compared to your enemy, where you have the uh, um, break between the armed forces and uh, uh, the population. Thank you very much, Dr. Shellis. Um, Alexander, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you very much, Eliza. And thank you very much to Jonathan and uh, Hugo for organizing this very interesting workshop. I've already learned a lot from uh, the comments provided by my colleagues. As to the question as to what are the lessons learned, I suppose so much really does depend on the context. I think Michael Kaufman was absolutely correct when he talked about how war or any war is its own context. And I think the corollary to that particular statement is that uh, the learned lessons will naturally um, be bespoke to a particular context. So uh, what are the lessons uh, will depend uh, for whom the lessons serve. So I think Ukraine, Poland, Taiwan, or for that matter, China would take away very different lessons from this particular war. For China, quite frankly, the lessons might be very unsavory to us. I think uh, their takeaway from watching how Russia is performing is that uh, they'll need to infiltrate uh, Taiwanese military and security services far more, uh, that they won't have, they can't go into any sort of contingency with the sorts of uh, assumptions uh, that Russia might have had going into uh, February 24th. Another lesson that they might learn, quite frankly, is that Russia might have been too soft in going about its initial missile salvos against command control structures, as well as some pieces of critical infrastructure. And so what lessons that China might learn uh, could therefore inform how Taiwan might approach the problem, which might therefore in turn inform how we might think about what Taiwan ought to do. But that all said, I think uh, there are two general views that I tend to have as a result of what I've observed from the last year. Uh, Hannah, I think, touched upon the first one. That is the importance of lethality and mobility. Um, I think there was a lot of hype in recent years about emerging disruptive technologies like cyber, artificial intelligence, quantum, and so forth as potential game changers that will uh, affect how we go about practicing deterrence or engaging in war fighting. And I do not want to diminish the importance of those technologies. Clearly cyber has seen um, extensive use in the Russo-Ukrainian war, perhaps uh, it's not as visible owing to the very character of that particular domain. But as Michael said in the keynote address, so much has turned on lethality and mobility. And indeed, it is an artillery war. Hamas has been a game changer precisely because it enables maneuver, in part by hitting Russian ammunition depots and command posts, thereby unlocking the ability of Ukraine to undertake counteroffensives. Tanks are still useful, maybe not for every single country, of course. Obviously, again, it depends on the context. But I think there are uh, many analysts who are mistaken when they look at Russian tank losses, predominant as they might be on social media, 
yeah. And make the sort of premature conclusion that all tanks are obsolete. I think that sort of view overlook, overlooks how Ukraine itself has used armored vehicles quite effectively in its defensive and counteroffensive efforts. And certainly other countries like Poland have taken note by purchasing large suites of uh, armored vehicles, including uh, main battle tanks. And indeed, I think now we can grasp the importance of munitions much more clearly than perhaps in the past. Uh, we are starting to see production ratchet up across NATO countries in a way that um, would be beneficial for Ukraine to uh, be able to endure this war and to fight effectively, but also to develop the military industrial capacity that would be a benefit as well to Taiwan, notwithstanding, of course, the major logistical difficulties that would come with resupplying that country. After all, Taiwan does not share a massive land border with uh, Poland, and so that alone would create enormous headaches uh, that I think we still fail to truly grasp. But again, it's not just a matter of hardware. I think, again, uh, software is very important too. And I think uh, what we have seen in the last year is that Ukraine software is relatively much more robust, in part because of the strong determination to fight, uh, as well as some of the combat experience that has accrued from uh, the war in the Donbass, static as it might be. Uh, I also think still that um, there has been an advantage in receiving NATO grade training from the United Kingdom, from Canada, and from the United States. Again, I, I don't want to overstate it for the reasons that uh, Michael had already mentioned in his keynote address. I think uh, it's very easy to be very self validating. This is, after all, Ukraine's fight. And indeed, um, these same countries did provide training to Iraq and to Afghanistan with very little success in that regard still. But I think that training was nevertheless an important vector for the change and reform within uh, Ukrainian military culture and mindset in a way that got away from some of the Soviet legacies that might have still existed within that particular system. I also think that there's a certain elasticity in the Ukrainian defense strategy that I think has been oftentimes overlooked, in part because of necessity. Ukraine has had to trade territory for time, but a defense in depth strategy of that sort uh, does require, unfortunately, sacrificing some populated areas to temporary occupation. There's a military logic, but the political and human costs can be massive. And so as much as I see in Poland, for example, a conversation about how there cannot be any Buchas and Urpins for good reason, uh, because of what had happened in those uh, communities, um, the fact of the matter is that trading that territory for time did ultimately serve Ukraine's um, purposes, at least for the medium term and the longer term, notwithstanding the massive and extraordinarily tragic cost that that incurred. So there's a certain military necessity that comes with strategy that gets overlooked, but the political cost can be indeed extremely painful. I think, as we have talked about already, the Ukrainian units have been much more flexible and much more integrated uh, with a developing capacity for rotation of the sort that we have not seen. We see different types of units doing different things. Obviously, the artillery units uh, are fighting very closely and very hard. Uh, but the territorial defense units that uh, Ukraine mobilized rather late um, did help to achieve several joint effects. Sometimes they were involved in the fighting, but usually for the sake of mop-up operations, sometimes with respect to public uh, order or the maintenance thereof, in particular with respect to reconnaissance and counterintelligence. Um, but when we think again of the lessons learned, like uh, with respect to Taiwan, uh, which I think you know might be the next contingency uh, of this sort of uh, gravitas, uh, it's clear that it's not just a matter of getting the hardware to that island country, um, there still needs to be a lot done within that country's military to better integrate, uh, to go about uh, force employment in a manner that would be much more effective. Unfortunately, we're still seeing uh, very much scripted exercises, a lack of training, uh, a very top-down heavy approach that might not uh, be useful for Taiwan in trying to forestall any sort of major uh, invasion attempt. So again, the lessons are going to be very different for for um, for the audience, for uh, whichever countries um, figuring out its own defense needs and 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 so forth. Um, but those are basically my two general thoughts in response to Eliza's question. 
Uh, thank you so much, um, Alex. So my we'll have another round of questions now um, for another 15 minutes or so, and then we'll move to the second round. Um, a, a question for Professor Osinga. So military organizations constantly train and prepare uh, to fight the next war. Uh, what do you think are the most important lessons for Western defense organizations that can be distilled from the war in Ukraine? Um. And briefly, I think I alluded to that in the last couple of sentences. Um, over the past 30 years, the West has heavily leaned on the luxury of having air superiority, air dominance, which allowed the West to basically op uh, operate at a high tempo during ground operations with limited risk for ground troops, could actually um, escalate quite rapidly, could put pressure on, on enemy leadership. It always assumed air superiority, and that underlying the air superiority was basically American command and control, EW, electronic warfare, uh, SEAT capabilities, and over the past two decades, also stealth capabilities. Europe uh, basically disinvested pretty much in high intensity air capabilities. And only recently have, has Europe started to reinvest in fifth generation uh, capabilities 30 years after they, that capability actually uh, demonstrated its value during the Operation Desert Storm. So I think one of the key challenges will be to uh, basically reinvest in capabilities that will guarantee us that the asymmetric edge that we leaned upon and re basically became addicted to over the past 30 years. And that has also shaped our preferred mode of warfare. Uh, underlying that awareness is that is, is the awareness that uh, we don't want to be drawn into an additional war that we've seen playing out in, in Ukraine. One of the reasons I'm saying all this also is um, we I had a deja vu with NATO strategy during the Cold War, in the last decade of the Cold War. Well, actually, when I was an F-16 pilot, it was the time when the, the West actually introduced the F-15s, F-16, the tornadoes and all that, the B-1 bombers. Um, and having those superior capabilities undermined the Russian strategy, which basically said, listen, we have the first, second, and third echelon of ground forces. Um, and we basically lost that awareness how much we depend on that, tacti that technical but also that strategic superiority that allow that is afforded to us by having these air power capabilities in the 90s and the 2000s most of our missions were peacekeeping missions stabilization missions they were manpower heavy but they relied also in afghanistan on having this umbrella of air power that allowed also in afghanistan our patrols to operate quite effectively and even survive uh, ambushes without all that many casualties. And uh, now again, we are being confronted with a peer competitor. And as the Baltic states said, listen, we are actually very lucky that this, this incursion didn't occur in our country because we don't have the same strategic depth as Ukraine. Um, one French analyst said uh, in looking in 2016 at the problems in the Baltic said, listen, this enhanced for presence is all very fine and well. They are a tripwire force, but without having the ground-based air defense, without having the stopping power of high mass and long range artillery, without having air superiority, they are not a tripwire, they are sitting ducks. And I think that was this is one of the key priorities for NATO uh, to take on board. Uh, we don't want to lose in the air denial war that we see playing out right now in, in Ukraine. Um, beyond that, obviously, there is there are lots of technical and technical lessons to be learned of the ground war, but there's much more we need to learn and we need to get much more data, in particular on the Ukrainian side, to, to, to really ascertain what the lessons are. But on the operational strategic level, we can also already see some strategic pointers and they point at the problem of air denial. Thank you very much, Professor Zinga. Uh, the, my next question is for Dr. Shellis. Uh, Ukraine has proven remarkably resilient in its ability to put up a defense and even push back uh, Russia. Can you please share your views on Ukraine's societal and democratic resilience and uh, what, you, what you think its sources might be? Dr. Shellis, no, the floor is, is yours. 
Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, there are two elements in this. Uh, one is uh, very philosophical, if you want to say, but that is uh, yet one lesson from this war that moral is still sometimes more important uh, than even the arms that you have. Because when you understand for what you fight, why you are fighting and what you are defending, especially when you are defending your land and your existence, you are becoming much more resilient. You are understanding both as the armed forces and the society why you need to, uh, I don't know, save electricity or to stay without it or why you need to do X, Y, uh, Z. And uh, uh, that's why when you speak with the armed forces of Ukraine, uh, they understand why they are in the battlefield. They have the high moral because of this. And that's why sometimes they're in the completely different situation that uh, the enemy, uh, for whom this war is still quite uh, amorphic and uh, ununderstandable with plenty of stereotypes and uh, propaganda. Uh, but when you speak about the society, uh, first element is definitely also this moral. Because uh, when you feel the missile uh, being bombed just near you, you understand that it is the uh, targeting your existence and your lives. And uh, if you're really afraid you're becoming refugee, otherwise you're trying to help everybody to, to survive and your company uh, to work. The second reason is probably the uh, historical uh, resilience of Ukrainian people. Uh, the history, uh, unfortunately, had a lot of uh, bad days for us, and uh, that's something that came with the DNA. There were plenty of researchers uh, about this among the sociologists, from the memories of the Galadomor to the Second World War to the partisans movements at that time. The question is uh, how it's interpreted, because for Russians, the Second World War, it is this... Uh, um, we can reach Berlin again, and for us, uh, that is understanding of uh, what we should do on the ground. But uh, number three is uh, something uh, more um, tangible. Uh, the year before the invasion, we adopted the uh, concept of national resistance and or, or resilience, depends how you translate it over there. And you have it uh, seven elements which are the same as NATO uh, resilience uh, um, base uh, supplies. And we are speaking about uh, uh, cyber, transportation, health system, critical infrastructure, political system, uh, communications, and all others. And Ukraine and NATO had the exercises for these, the plans, and everything that was being developed. We had um, uh, individual document just for the critical infrastructure so we had the protocols understanding what and how should be done uh, but to uh, those uh, seven uh, um, nato baselines we also added two additional that appeared very important one is connected with the uh, uh, financial system resilience and if you uh, uh, analyze these 12 months our banks uh, uh, never closed them never we had any problems uh, with the uh, banking system, we had access through the digital instruments uh, uh, and all others. So it proved to be important because it didn't bring shocks to the economic system. And the second uh, uh, additional point, it is information uh, resilience and information security. Because here as well, we had nine years of experience of Russian propaganda and information warfare. So all those ideas from closing the TV channels to um, control of the information space, not control in terms of the, uh, uh, in the bad meaning of this word, but control over the Russian line <laughs> operations in social networks. Uh, that's definitely uh, been very, very useful because it's allowed the proper flow of information. But that's also included the strategic communications. Because for people, if you speak about the uh, uh, people resilience, they always need to feel this connection and information that they receive from the government. And this trust that is built through it, because the most dangerous in crisis, it is when you're in the information vacuum, uh, because it brings panic and that allows your enemy to manipulate with you. When you have a daily communication of the president and other ministries, doesn't matter, you are pro-president or from the opposition. But you have information, you understand where are your members of parliament, you have the daily communication from the energy company, which is saying that today we have these, these, there is no light because of this. It allows people to feel themselves uh, more secure and that the situation is under control. And that's also very important for the societal resilience, because when you have information, you can plan 
you can understand uh, what is in your hands, what is in the hands of the government, what is in the hands of the enemy. And having all this information, making the certain plan for prep protocols, if we speak about business, how to operate in these conditions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sherlis. Um, another question now for um, Alex. So Western aid has contributed significantly to Ukraine's ability to defend itself and to this resilience that Dr. Sherlis was just talking about. Um, a coalition of nations has come uh, to support Ukraine under the leadership of the US, but this was of course after the escalation of the conflict, not before. So what kind of lessons do you think we can distill in terms of coalition and alliance management? So I have to, of course, preface my answer by highlighting that uh, Ukraine is not a NATO member. It is a partner to NATO by way of the Enhanced Opportunities Program, much like what Georgia, Sweden, and Finland uh, are currently. So, of course, the political relationship uh, that Ukraine has with various North American European countries will be very different than what, say, the Baltic countries will have. But with that said, I think um, th there is a positive story and there is a negative story. I think the positive story is a little more intuitive, precisely uh, given the very premise of your question. Western military assistance has been fairly robust, has been increasing steadily over time to encompass more and more uh, weapon systems that can enable greater lethality and uh, mobility on the part of the Ukrainian armed forces. Some of it is certainly slow to come, perhaps too slow. And indeed, there were initial hangups, especially uh, in the spring of last year, as to whether it will be desirable, if not feasible, to provide certain forms of military assistance. Leopard 2 tanks, for example, might take too long to have Ukrainian operators get trained. Of course, had we begun, begun training much sooner, um, that uh, would not be so much of a concern right now. Uh, but all the same, I think, again, uh, that level of support exceeds what was expected initially, precisely because a number of countries had serious concerns, found well-founded or not, about potential escalation, diversion, and so forth that could come with the use of those weapons. I tend to do think, and this is, again, part of the positive story, that the Western alliance has been much more cohesive and unified than what many would have expected. Of course, it's a 30-member going on 32-member uh, military alliance. You expect there to be some disagreement. The fact that we can only uh, name a handful of countries really on one hand and still have fingers to spare, uh, Turkey and Hungary being those two cases, uh, really, I think, says a lot to how um, much more unified the alliance really has been. Um, that being said, I think the bad news is that um, there's a credible story out there that this entire thing could have been avoided in the first place. Um, that had the alliance shown the sort of cohesiveness that it has shown since February and March of last year, uh, the willingness to provide certain systems to Ukraine um, without the sorts of hangups that we've seen articulated in various NATO capitals, then perhaps deterrence could have held in a way that Putin would not have dared to launch the full-scale invasion. It's fundamentally an unobservable, uh, impossible counterfactual uh, to ascertain precisely because we're not entirely sure what is uh, the true motivations that Putin really has. Of course, we can have very good conjectures to that effect. Um, there may be an argument out there that he was not at all deterrable, um, but I think it's reasonable to say that the United States didn't really practice deterrence as regards to Ukraine. Uh, this is a position that was very brief, um, more recently elaborated by my colleague and friend uh, Liam Collins in foreign policy, whereby there was just very little inclination to uh, send strong deterrent signals uh, to Russia that could have forestalled uh, what has happening or has been happening since February of last year. The military buildup began over the course of 2021, or rather in the spring, and then it certainly amped up over the course of the fall of that year. There were opportunities to send um, certain signals, but the Biden administration um, had decided to let the issue of Nord Stream 2 fall by the wayside with Germany. Uh, there were concerns about the provision of military assistance to um, 
uh, Ukraine around the same time. There was a stated desire to have a, um, a stable and predictable relationship with Russia. And indeed, it was not very long after Putin had met with Biden in Geneva that Putin published that essay where he articulated the view that Ukrainians and Russians are but one people. That's when we start seeing a uh, sea change in rhetoric from the Kremlin as regards to Ukraine. So there could be a deterrence failure that resulted from some of the uh, alliance politics that did um, take shape over the course of 21, namely uh, how the United States was really intent on trying to focus on the China problem really at the expense of Europe, thereby um, forsaking some of the issues that I mentioned already. So that is a bit of a darker side to uh, the more positive story that we have seen. And I think um, it's still too early to conjecture like how much weight we should give precisely because of the uncertainty we have about these sorts of counterfactuals. But I think it is important all the same to keep uh, them in mind. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, we're gonna, we're, we have a, until um, 10 o'clock, I would say, for this last round of questions that I'm gonna be asking, and then we're gonna take Q&A. Um, so uh, a question for Professor Arzinga, um, I would say a more philosophical question, a, a very abstract and, and, and important question. Uh, Professor Arzinga, what do you think the war in Ukraine tells us about changes and continuities in the character of war? Let's be very careful about that. Um... Again, context, context rules here. Um, my argument previously was when we put it in the context of NATO, we really don't want to be dragged in, drag into um, a nutritional war. Uh, so sometimes you don't have the luxury to choose that. Um, but there isn't all that much novelty at the operational strategic level. In fact, you, we may see some regression because the, the, the aggressional style warfare that we see right now are, are very similar to the ones that we have seen prior to, uh, to, to the operation of Desert Storm. Um, we don't see maneuver warfare uh, as the West has practiced uh, over the past decades. Um, some technological features um, also featured in those books that, that predicted what the future of war would look like. For instance, cyber warfare. There's been a huge cyber offensive ongoing uh, ever since uh, the start of the war, even prior to that. But it hasn't been as um, effective as Russia would have liked uh, for various uh, reasons. Uh, it, uh, uh, basically, it has become a front, a domain next to, in parallel to, and supporting other operations. When we look at drones and all that, uh, I think we already saw in the Gorno Karabakh war the increasing influence of drones. Um, we see loitering drones, and that is the shape of the future, in part. It is a new feature of the, on the ecosystem of the battle space. Um, it doesn't replace, as some people argue, uh, all the weapon system. There, um, the tank nor the artillery systems are obsolete. Their role might shift. We have to look at the dynamic between the tank and the anti-tank system. The designs of tanks might have to change. But those systems are not obsolete. Similar with manned aircraft. We will see manned aircraft paired with unmanned aircraft. Uh, other people said, listen, the, the, the future is one of hypersonic missiles. Well, we haven't seen that really. The hypersonic missiles that we have seen uh, were, far, were, were few, not all that accurate. They were effective in the sense they, they blasted through the air defense systems. Um, but they were all novel aspects in the ecosystem of battlefields that add up and not replace other systems. They do present challenges for the defender. Uh, but as with the tank evolution over the past uh, 100 years, basically, you see an action-reaction dynamic. Same with air warfare. And one of the key aspects that I alluded to was that the defense in air warfare seems to have the, have the upper hand. And now the challenge is to regain the, 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 uh, the offensive uh, again on the, uh, on the Western side. Uh, we haven't talked about the nuclear aspect, right? We've seen the reintroduction, really, of nuclear saber ratting in a way that we hadn't witnessed uh, prior to this war. Uh, interestingly, it isn't Putin, it is his bloggers, his social media uh, friends, and it is Medvedev who really uses the nuclear rhetoric as a, as a threat. But the, the basically the, the, the lighthearted way that the nuclear rhetoric is being employed again by Russia is a novel aspect. And I think that has a strategic um, 
strategic impact for politics in the next uh, in the next couple of years. Uh, but again, already in 2016, Medvedev said that we, we are living in a new Cold War era with the West. Um, we saw how the nuclear forces had been um, modernized on the Russian side. We saw how the nuclear arms reduction and uh, confidence building measures were slowly, all those regimes were slowly basically eroding in front of our eyes. So again, that is not a real novel aspect. So I think there's a lot of continuity. Uh, we have to look very specifically in some little technical aspects to what extent that really starts to uh, shape and change future warfare at the operational level and perhaps on the strategic level. I don't, I don't see that much. I see a regression. Industrial warfare is a regression in that sense. It's also a regression um, that we haven't really been prepared for over the past decades. We have really slimmed our industrial capacity down to very limited numbers. Let me leave it at that. Thank you very much, Professor Zinga. Dr. Schellis, you were an advisor to the working group preparing Ukraine's um, naval strategy 20, 2035. How has the war shaped that strategy? And also, what are the key lessons from the war in Ukraine that actors in the wider Black Sea region could take? You know, uh, when we've been planning, definitely uh, uh, the Russian aggression and the possibility of bigger aggression was one of the points that we considered. But it seems to me that even military back in 2018 uh, couldn't imagine the scope of the aggression that Russia will take place. And at that time, they spoke a lot about the capabilities, not about the platforms. So what we need and protection of the course was one of the main and reconnaissance was the second main point. Uh, but uh, money for the build of any new platform definitely was the main uh, obstacle for the proper development. We need to understand that back in 2014, Ukraine left 75% of both platforms and personnel in Crimea. So the fact that we built from the scratch and those promises that we just received in 2019, 20 from Turkey, from the United Kingdom, from some other countries about the new ships, uh, they they just started to be implemented at that time. So all we had is just few ships, uh, even not the ships, but the boats from the United States. So I can't say that what we planned in 2018 definitely happened uh, by 2022. It was only the first stage of that strategy. However, what we learned, and probably that will lead us to the change of the strategy, even though the, the basics uh, will be the same, it's still important, the same uh, things for your frame, but... Uh, these were emphasized even twice, the importance of the ports and the safety of navigations for the commercial and uh, the protection of the ports, because Russians started to block Ukrainian ports one month before the full-fledged invasion. From the beginning of the February, all the territorial waters around been closed as for the exercises. And the fact that that disrupted the uh, uh, trade, that because 70% of Ukrainian goods were coming by uh, sea at that time. Uh, the second is uh, uh, demonstrated us very clearly that uh, uh, what we need now, it's not only the big platforms, but there are more and more attention uh, to the uh, uh, coastal artillery and to the marine drones. Back in 2018, we just started to speak about the possibilities and these capabilities. What is interesting, I still remember one of the producers, state institution, who said, like, we already have this project, we would like to propose you. And most of the people in the room was a little bit skeptical. Do we really need it? Is it effective? Now you see that that is something what a lot of countries started to consider, especially after Ukraine used uh, these marine drones against the Sevastopol base. Uh, just a month ago. So that, that's definitely the thing that we are talking. And the last but not the least is definitely the lessons, at least that Ukraine learned, uh, is uh, uh, about uh, air defense capacities of the Navy platforms. Let's name it like this. Because we had the dramatic change of the operational situation after Moscow ship was sunk. And uh, our Moscow ship was important, not that much because of the caliber missiles that they carried. Uh, there are many other platforms that they, uh, could carry them. But that was the main air defense point for the whole Black Sea fleet of the Russian Federation. 
immediately after uh, targeting it with the Ukrainian Neptune missiles, we saw the change of the uh, locations and disposition of the uh, Russian Navy. We saw the move uh, from uh, just what was direct from uh, Odessa. They moved to another side of Crimea. They started to use less attacks uh, from the ships. And uh, one of the main reasons, because uh, they lost the protection for their own ship. They understood that we have capabilities to target them, especially in the complex operations when you use air drones and uh, proper missiles. That's why um, Take Island was so important. Even that, that, that is extremely small island and everybody thought like, okay, who cares about it? But that was like the additional air defense point for the Russians after Moscow ship um, it collapsed. Uh, so it seems to me that maritime sphere would bring us more and more additional lessons. But many of the lessons that we learned, um, they came earlier than February 2022. And we wrote uh, in one of the projects with Alex about these, we talked about poofing, about war of exercises, about closing zones and all other stuff. So it seems to me that in this, at least in our case, the maritime domain had much more importance in preparation to the war, in threatening before the war, rather than during uh, these 12 months of war itself. Thank you very much, Dr. Shellis. I would like to remind um, uh, people in the audience to prepare questions for the Q&A and to put them in the Q&A or Q&R um, part of, of the Zoom platform. Um, and if people are there in person to, to raise their hands uh, when we are gonna be done with this uh, last question. And I'm gonna ask uh, Alex actually. So uh, what are the, um, the likelihood, what, what are the scenarios for the escalation of the conflict? Um, in, in, in light of the fact that the US, for instance, is sending its Patriot um, air defense system to Ukraine and as well as tanks in cooperation with Germany and others, uh, there's also pressure mounting for uh, fighter jets to be sent to Ukraine. So has escalation become uh, inevitable and, and where can it lead us? Um, Alex, sure. the floor is yours. Sure, I don't interpret the provision of military assistance to Ukraine as escalatory in part because it does not extend uh, the field of violence, Ukraine's um, fighting in self-defense. Sure, it sometimes has attacked uh, military facilities or sites within on Russian territory, um, but even so, it pales in comparison to what Russia is undertaking, uh, has been undertaking since the 24th of February. If anything, I think you can argue that uh, Western militaries have become much more entangled in the conflict um, by dint of their provision of that military assistance, but it's not escalatory by any means. As regards to the F-16s issue, I interpret that as being a move by Ukraine to seek uh, longer-term investment in its own security. I don't think that necessarily will translate to something with immediate gains, at least uh, as far as 2023 is concerned, precisely because of the timetables involved with the provision and training of those um, uh, pilots, uh, training of those pilots with the provision of those platforms. Um, they'll take time, whereas, Platforms like the Leopard 2 will have much more immediate impact on the battlefield and probably much more suited to Ukraine's uh, immediate needs all the same. Um, so where would it lead? I, I can see more and more openness on the part of Western militaries to provide um, expanded ranges of uh, ammunition systems or artillery systems. Um, right now, there's some question as to what exactly is um, uh, behind the uh, recent attacks on Mariupol in the last few weeks, uh, or last few days, pardon me, uh, because those seem to be pushing against uh, some of the official ranges of some of the artillery systems that Ukraine is known to have. I think that um, a lot of the hangups that uh, Western military officials and political leaders have had with regards to Ukraine have for sure dissipated over time, especially as regards to how they're seeing Ukrainian military personnel integrate and use those weapons quite effectively. Um, and indeed, one of the reasons why um, the West has been um, gradual in its approach towards uh, the provision of military assistance, frankly, uh, because uh, it's drawing on stores and, 
uh, there's a lot of variation amongst Western militaries as to how well prepared they are for any sort of uh, military contingency as this one. And research that I've published with uh, Jordan Becker of West Point, we have found that one of the best predictors of the provision of military assistance to Ukraine since uh, February 24th, um, with all the caveats uh, that we should invoke because of the uncertainties um, involved here, is in fact military spending on the part of those uh, uh, countries, uh, in particular, uh, investment in operations and maintenance. Uh, that is the best predictor, not so much things that we might believe to have been important, like dependence on Russian hydrocarbons. It actually does not seem to matter that much. And that is indeed one success story that Europe has. Now, precisely because uh, the industrial capacity is now recognized as a critical variable for reasons that uh, Franz had uh, mentioned, the uh, investment in that particular capacity moving forward will certainly ensure uh, some flow of munitions in a way that will certainly rebound uh, to Ukraine. So I can imagine that the assistance will continue. There might be some questions about the um, commitment of some countries, in particular if there's a, an election that might go awry. But uh, all things considered, I think we're in a much better place than we thought we would be. And I think the military assistance will continue. Uh, I don't want to say anything is in inevitable, but, uh, and I don't necessarily think that any new uptick in military assistance would be escalatory for the reasons that I mentioned, but I think um, Western militaries are now of the mindset that Ukraine needs to win and that it needs to be provisioned accordingly. Great. Thank you so much, um, uh, Alexander. And so we are now uh, opening the floor to questions from the uh, audience. I am uh, unfortunately not able to see if there are any hands in the um, in the room where the conference is taking place in person. So uh, if that is the case, um, I might ask somebody who is there to, to help with this. Um, but before, since we are still now uh, looking at a, a few questions that were asked for our uh, keynote speaker, I'm actually going to start this very quickly myself. Um, something along the lines of what I was asking Alex, but perhaps with uh, a view to another um, another part of this of Eastern Europe, um, is um, something about um, the escalation of the war. Uh, in, in Moldova, for instance, what are the chances, do you think, and, and how capable would Russia be uh, to, to foment unrest and to perhaps start um, um, make, creating difficulties for Ukraine and for Moldova with the help of the Transnistrian separatists? Um, so basically catching uh, Ukrainian forces, um, not necessarily by surprise, but but attacking them from the western side of the front. So, if any of you would like to have a, a short intervention uh, on this, that would be grateful. Uh, that would be great. Uh, and we do have a question from an audience member, so uh, we'll go to that uh, as soon as you you want to. As soon as you answer this question, I will jump here because I live just uh, um, less than fifty kilometers from Transnistria, and that is the top issue uh, both in the beginning of the war and now. Uh, what is the situation? In the beginning of the war, the first several weeks, uh, everybody been expecting that uh, Russia will start something from Transnistria. However, we need to understand several things. First of all, uh, that uh, at least 70% of the Russian armed forces in Transnistria, that is local population of Transnistria. So these people were happy to receive salary in the peaceful time and to drink wine at their homes, but to fight and die for Russia, it is uh, definitely not what they expect. That's why we started noticing it both in the security services and in the military that it is absolute absence of willingness. And even more, many of the locals are started not to prolong their contracts with the Russian armed forces back in March and April. That was the tendency that we uh, followed. Also, uh, even the, the numbers sound quite nice of what it is, uh, both the Transnistrian forces and Russian trans, uh, uh, forces, but they are still not capable for the full operation without the support from the eastern side or from the south. And the equipment that they have there, it is in the very bad uh, condition because for nine years they didn't receive a proper maintenance, uh, the supply of the spares. And just let's be honest, uh, it was neglected. So they were bringing these equipment twice a year, one for exercises, the second time in the best case for the parade. Uh, so eight tanks that they had on paper, uh, 100 kilometers would be difficult for them to pass. 
So what we really were afraid that is some kind of provocations or explosions of the ammunition before. Then for many months we forgot about uh, Transnistria except of the smuggling routes. That was important because yes, different guns and weapons were coming, but that was for the border officers. The last three days, it is the history here in the uh, Russian and Transnistrian uh, uh, social networks. The Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation yesterday even made a statement early in the morning. Uh, the idea that they tried to present and to manipulate that Ukraine is going to attack Transnistria to help Moldova. That's definitely a total uh, nonsense because there is no sense for Ukraine to do it. Moldova never asked about this, first of all. The second, why we need to spend our resources if it is not direct threat from there. So uh, um, that's why we understand that, again, we have, first of all, the information operation that is very important. And the second is that some provocations uh, theoretically can happen, as they used to be nine months ago when Russian drones uh, are just followed the Russian territory, but presented it is Ukraine trying to attack something in Transnistria. So something of the similar scale we can uh, um, expect even now. Another question that Russia is definitely trying to destabilize Moldova itself, and that is important for us. Because here we have demonstrations, we have already that some of these opposition parties created the military units, like Shore Party just created approximately five, six hundred people of the military unit that support the demonstration. And we heard all this crazy idea as to capture airports or other stuff. That can be dangerous, considering, like I mean, can it be done or not, we can have another one hour of technical uh, discussions. But the problem is that Moldova doesn't have any air defense at all as a type of the forces. So that's why any type of Russian provocation from the air can be really dangerous uh, for the country itself. Thank you very much, Dr. Schellest. Um, I would love to hear um, any other interventions uh, on this question from Professor Zinga or Alex, uh, but they would have to be very short because we would uh, go on to the next questions. Um, anybody uh, who wants to, to take something, say, say something about this? No, I'm happy to move on to the next question. Hannah was very comprehensive in her answer. Excellent. Um, so in that case, uh, since Professor Singa is, is probably, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything from him. I'm gonna go to a question from Dylan Reitz, who's asking about the, um, uh, the effect of sanctions. He's wondering whether the increase of sanctions um, has had a considerable toll um, against uh, things uh, like more tangible items for Russia and other involved countries. So basically is Russia suffering at all uh, from the sanctions uh, that has been imposed against it. Um, this is again a question open to um, any of our, our, our speakers uh, on, on this panel. May, may I start with that? Because it's a very important question. There's a lot of debate also in my country, uh, also on social media, where people say sanctions don't work. Well, that's, that, that's the wrong answer, uh, because define work. Um, before we get into the effectiveness, uh, first of all, you need to define what the objectives are. Uh, sanctions have a couple of objectives. First of all, signaling that the norm has been broken, violated. It is a political signal. Um, and sanctions might deter an action, but once an opponent has actually launched an operation, the incursion is ongoing. Um, the deterrence value of sanctions is actually very low. Um, beyond that, then, you get into the constrain and compel uh, function of, uh, of sanctions. First of, all, first of all, compel. You hope to inflict costs uh, that might convince an opponent to actually stop the operation. The other one is constrain. Um, make it hard to get access to certain technologies. And in that latter aspect, you will find that uh, currently the sanctions do have an impact on the aviation industry, the military industry, on the ICT sector of the Soviet, uh, of, of the Russian society. Uh, we see the GDP slowly degrading, inflation is, uh, is, uh, is rising. Uh, so yes, it has an economic, but also a military impact. It is affecting the rate of production of precision weapons and cruise missiles. Uh, will it lead to Putin changing his mind? No, but it will inflict cost upon him. It will have an impact in the long run. Uh, it also explains why he goes to South to North Korea, goes to Iran, and approaches China. 
um, from the Western side, two aspects here. Um, what alternatives are there, right? Could we have afforded not to um, impose sanctions? Probably not. Now the question is, and Hungary comes to mind here, uh, what do we do when so one of the EU countries actually vetoes the prolongation of sanctions or wants to uh, lift some, some sanctions off the list or some individuals uh, off the list? So imposing sanctions also entraps the countries involved. Uh, final comment. Uh, this is a very this is a historically unprecedented, uh, uh, stringent set of sanctions. Um, but they are no, not multilateral, in, in, they are not global. China, India, a whole host of countries don't actually subscribe to the sanction regimes. They might be punished for it, but until they actually comply with, uh, with uh, the sanction regime, right? Uh, Russia has the ability to circumvent certain sanctions. But I would say overall, um, it was a very logical and strategically and politically sound move to impose that very stringent set of sanctions it has surprised everyone that um, on the Sunday after the 24th of February last year, uh, the West imposed sanctions, including energy and SWIFT. Uh, and I would say that that symbolizes the fact that the West has rediscovered what it means to be the West. Thank you very much, Professor Zinga. Uh, Alex, would you like to, to respond to this question or yeah, should we move on? Very quickly, I agree with everything that was just said. I would just note that uh, there's also a reassurance value to sanctions. Um, Lauren Sukin and I did a survey, as it turns out, in mid-March of last year in Poland, the three Baltic countries, and Romania. And one of the findings that we produced was that the respondents looked very favorably upon the fact that the United States and its partners uh, in Canada, the United Kingdom, and the European Union imposed the sorts of sanctions that they did impose precisely because it demonstrated, one, engagement in the security uh, issue at play, and secondly, a, a willingness and strong desire to manage escalation risks, that uh, precisely because um, an alternative to sanctions would be to perhaps fight in the war itself, to be directly in combat with Russian forces and engage them directly. Um, response thought that sanctions offered an indirect, more uh, de-escalatory or non-escalatory way uh, for the United States and its partners to show commitment to European security. So it has a very diffuse effect for the reasons that France had mentioned. I don't want to diminish those. I think those are probably even more important than what I just mentioned, but this reassurance value actually does exist and response do see sanctions at play. And I think since 2014, uh, we have seen a debate about you know the endurance or durability of those sanctions and it does take a reassurance value. Right? If the Trump administration had lifted sanctions, for example, on Russia, then that would have been uh, something that would be very unreassuring for many audiences in Central and Eastern Europe. Elisa, uh, thank you very much. I don't know if you can hear me. There's one question here at the Citadel, and I know that we have two minutes left. So maybe a very quick question from uh, sure. Professor Justin Messi, and then a very quick answer. Thank you. Sure. Well, thanks a lot for this uh, great panel, and hopefully you can answer my question uh, in the brief minutes we have left. Uh, there's a lot of debate uh, given the weaknesses, critical weaknesses we've seen in the Russian military and the fact that it will be bogged down in Ukraine for quite a while, that NATO should not fear for an invasion of its territory and therefore uh, should not necessarily enhance the, uh, the uh, four presence present uh, to the brigade level that was uh, committed uh, last June. And there's significant debate of even the capacity and willingness of, of Russia to invade a NATO ally. Uh, what's your take on this? Should we be worried and plan for this? Or can we learn from the war in Ukraine that uh, Ukraine that Russia does not have the intention nor the capacity to attack a formal ally? Uh, uh, would whoever, whoever would like. If, if, I, if I may. Um, sure, of course. I've got this question so many times over the past year doing the public lectures, right? Haven't we overestimated basically uh, the threat from Russia? Um, if you live right now in the Baltic states or in Poland, right? There's a different perspective. Despite all the military setbacks that Russia has suffered right now, the fact that Putin hasn't achieved strategic objectives, it has still uh, um, 
has imposed 500 billion to 1,000 billion worth of damage upon um, Ukrainian society. There is a risk that the Baltic states, nor Poland, nor anyone else in the Eastern European side really wants to, 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 to run. So I think there's absolute strategic reasons why we want to make sure that our, de our deterrence is so credible that Russia in the future, even if, uh, if it has rebuilt its military, will, will simply be, um, <laughs> will be deterred from any aggression that we see right now in Ukraine. Thank you. Dr. Schellest, Alex, any quick response to the question we just received? Um, you know, let's be honest, we both underestimated and overestimated, and it depends on the countries involved, but as an organization, NATO definitely made a lot of mistakes in the very beginning in terms of communication. It was understandable in terms of operational that they concentrated uh, inside, because that is the main purpose of the organization to defend the member states. But at the same time, because March and April been wasted with the statements that NATO cannot do uh, anything, that gave a lot of arguments uh, to the Russian Federation. However, with the Swedish and Finnish application, with the reaction of these countries and of the alliance um, uh, towards the Russian statements after this, it seems to me that uh, Brussels definitely regained and now what is really interesting for those who can read Russian and following like uh, narrative analysis discourse in the Russian social networks, as soon as they are losing in Ukraine, they never lose to Ukrainian armed forces. They always lose to NATO forces. They are especially to Polish, that will be pleasant to Alex, uh, but th that is probably the biggest uh, uh, monster for them. But at the same time, each time it is the statement that Russian forces needed to withdraw or lost, it's always not because of NATO weapons, but because they are fighting against NATO and um, uh, against the NATO soldiers. So uh, um, that's why it seems to me that NATO definitely underestimated the Owen deterrent um, image that could play for uh, many inside of the Russian Federation. Thank you so much, Dr. Hershalist. Um, Alex, any quick response? So the beauty of the enhanced board presence is exactly its scalability. And the fact that Canada might be struggling to, to upgrade uh, uh, its uh, battle group there from battalion size to brigade size, I think is actually a feature, not a bug. That now we actually have a clear and defined goal to which we can aspire. Uh, and maybe it's not necessarily uh, military advantageous precisely because so many of the units that Russia, the Russian army has stationed in Kaliningrad and near the Baltic countries did suffer massive attrition. The fact of the matter is, as Franz did mention, uh, it can still reconstitute itself. It has a lot of mass to bear. It still has rained down a lot of just, uh, the death and destruction. But still, from a force planning perspective, we now have an easily identifiable problem on our hands and we can work towards solving it. And I think that's the the virtue of the enhanced forward presence. Not one that perhaps was intended uh, in its inception, but one that I think has emerged over time. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and I would like to apologize to members of the audience who ask questions that we are not going to be able to uh, answer now. We are a little bit over time, uh, three minutes over time. I apologize as, as moderator for uh, not really sticking to the schedule, but it was a fascinating con uh, conversation and debate. Uh, we, think, uh, we thank the organizers for putting together this roundtable. This, this, this has been fantastic. And many thanks to our um, distinguished panelists for uh, being here with us and sharing their uh, knowledge and expertise with us. So um, from, from my end, uh, many thanks to Professor Singa, Dr. Shellis, Professor Lanoshka, and I look forward to seeing you uh, again in a, in a similar context. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, fantastic panel. It's now time for a coffee break here at the Citadel. We will resume at 10.30 Eastern time. So stick around, uh, stay with us, and uh, yeah, see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you.